there are legitimately under 50 artists in the world using crypto in a, in a meaningful way today. And the ones who lean into this and take this seriously now are going to see tremendous upside over the next couple of years. I got one question. How do I lean into this? When we get off, when we get, when we get off this... <laughs> Jordan, what's good, man? How are we feeling? I'm good, Sam. How are you? Yo, I'm good, man. This uh, this interview is definitely a jolt of some fresh energy. Uh, we got Cooper Turley on the show today. Cooper leads crypto strategy at Audius, which is a blockchain-powered music streaming and sharing platform that puts the power back in the hands of content creators. Um, in the episode, I think we do an incredible job speaking at a high level to what are some of the really interesting things happening at the happening at the intersection of crypto and, and blockchain tech and the music industry. More specifically, we dive deep into NFTs, which are non-fungible tokens, scarce digital content, if you will, digital collectibles of sorts. Um, we speak to how artists are tapping into the world of NFTs, how you can do the same as the market continues to grow. To date, there's already been over $50 million in transactions around the these NFTs, and I think this number is only going to continue to grow. Uh, and I really, uh, what I really appreciate about this episode is that, like, the crypto world is so filled with speculation and hype around coins and people trying to chase Bitcoin and buy Ethereum, um, rather than really focusing on what is the actual kind of disruptive value and, and technological applications that this technology is bringing to the market. And I think in this episode, we dive very specific into actual applications and ways that you and ways that artists can really leverage blockchain tech to grow their community and make money. So really love this episode. Special shout out to my uh, really close friend, Michael Gassiarek, for, for making the intro to, to make this possible. What do you think, Jordan? Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything you said. And I think what people will really get from this episode too is it, is it laid out, like you're saying, in a very tactical way for people to approach it and actually use it in their own careers. I know for, for me specifically, I didn't know much about the subject before this episode. So it's super exciting for me to just go through it and go through the recording. You'll, you'll hear me say, oh shit, several times because I'm having those aha moments. And I think that a lot of people will as well. So, you know, maybe we can all say it in unison together as you listen to it. Um, I think NFTs are, are super interesting thing to, to speak on. I saw, for example, and I talk about this during the podcast, Mike Shinoda uh, released an NFT recently and I had no idea what it was. So this recording is coming in at a perfect time. And afterwards, to give you an idea, I, you know, near the end of the interview, I asked him, you know, how can I get involved in this, in this world of cryptocurrency as a, as a music business person? So whether you're an artist, whether you're a manager or, or someone just looking to, to invest in, in upcoming artists, this will give you the tools that you need to, to go into that world confidently. Thousand percent. Well, without any further ado, uh, Cooper Turley. Cooper, what's happening, man? How you doing today? Hey, what's up, guys? Thank you for having me. Yeah, man, very excited. So I, I think there's a, this is a conversation. I think it's timely, um, just because I do think this is something that uh, will only continue to become more and more relevant and important um, as far as how artists can really tap into, and this I'll speak in broad generalizations and you'll help deconstruct it, but tap into some of the really interesting evolutions within the world of blockchain technology. So for starters, we'd really love to like set the stage um, and as much as you can within layman's terms, can you just kind of like deconstruct what is blockchain technology and what are some applications you think will spearhead its application within the, the music industry? For sure. So when I think about blockchain, I like to think of this term called the ownership economy. It basically means creating value and owning the value in the platforms you use every day. So for me, when I think of crypto, you know, obviously there's the financial value behind a lot of these tokens. But the stuff that interests me is more about you know, how do you contribute value to a platform and then capture that in the form of a vehicle that's really attractive? And so for the sake of this conversation, NFTs, social tokens, these are all terms that have been thrown around quite a lot. Um, it all boils down to this idea of a creator economy. So how does someone who has content that is valuable release that in a digital age and capture value from it? And to me, I think blockchain has been the clearest way to do it so far to date. I like that. So when awesome. it comes... Go ahead, oh, I'm sorry. I have, I have a follow-up question. We're both just so excited for this episode. Yeah, I, I literally told <laughs> Sam, like, bro, apologies in advance. I'm going to be asking a ton of questions. Um, how do you extract that value? Because I've seen that online as well as far as NFTs. I saw Mike Shinoda recently just put out a song with an NFT. How do you extract that value from um, the consumer, I guess, without charging them more as well? Like, how do you, how do you, how are you balancing, how do you balance that ecosystem with, with blockchain? Let's even just take a step back yeah. to, to define NFT clearly. Yeah. 
NFT stands for non-fungible token. The way I like to think of this is digitally scarce content. So basically you can have a piece of content on the internet that has a provably scarce value. So in the same way that there's a Mona Lisa in the real world, you can have a digital version of that and prove that there's an owner of it. And so to your question about how you determine value and how you extract value, one of the cool things we've seen with um, crypto is that markets form on their own. You know, Rather than a creator having to be the sole proprietor of what something is worth, you can place a value on it that you think is fair as a creator. And as that, that piece of content trades on secondary markets, that creator can capture value as well. So what we've seen examples of is artists releasing their NFTs for $1.00. Those NFTs then trading for thousands of dollars on a secondary market. But because there's technology in place to capture that resale value, that creator is getting upside the whole way along rather than in the world today where they only capture value off that primary sale. Damn, that's crazy. That's crazy as shit. So you're, so you're saying that if, if it's resold over and over again, because it's tied to that specific creator, they're able to make money from it every time it's resold. Yeah, and the best part of it is that's hard-coded into the asset itself. So there's no reliance on a middleman to do that for you. Those transactions happen automatically in real time. So, sorry, Sam, I got one, one more question about that. I told you I was going to ask a lot of questions. Told you. So what's the point of selling it at $1 to start as opposed to $15, $20, that sort of thing? Uh, just so that the market can determine the pricing themselves. You know, I think creators mm-hmm. get in this weird box where they try and price their own content. And especially with what we're seeing with NFTs and higher-end content, you know, most NFTs are going from anywhere from like $500 to $1,000 on the primary market. And so that right off the bat alienates a lot of your, your user base, right? right. And so pricing it at something really cheap and giving everyone a base floor to get in when finance isn't really an issue. And then allowing these markets to develop um, naturally based on the demand of the collectors. You know, it's kind of a better way to make the artists feel less anxious about having to determine a price that they feel like is fair and that collectors also think is fair. Wow. All right. Go ahead, Sam. My bad. Yeah, no, for sure. So, I mean, with that said, when you say the, the kind of when it's resold, an artist is still getting compensated. So it's essentially a commission structure built into any transactions. Is that like a set commission percentage or can you dive deeper there as far as that dynamic? Yeah, so it varies depending on the platform you're selling through. There's a primary fee, which is usually a fixed cut that comes out of the primary sale that goes to the platform. So if I sell on something like Nifty Gateway, Nifty Gateway will take a commission on that primary sale. But anytime there's a secondary sale of that asset, there's a commission that goes back to the creator itself. And so those dynamics are kind of what we see as a standardization across all of these, where there's a primary fee that goes to the platform and then a secondary fee that goes to the creator. But um, now with different protocols like Aura, you know, creators can basically base this fee into the sale at at that inception. So if I want to say, you know, when this piece resells in the future, um, I take 50% of that, I get 5% of that, I get 100% of that. That's a custom feature that you can basically define as a creator and sort of opts into the value of this NFT. Yeah, for sure. What was the protocol you mentioned? Agora? Zora. Zora. What exactly else does that protocol define? It allows you to, it puts a market into the asset itself. So today in the NFT world, um, an NFT is basically a digital collectible, which means that a platform has to facilitate the transactions around it. So when someone's buying and selling it, that's happening through a platform rather than the asset itself. What Zora did is bake that market directly into the asset so that regardless of what platform you sell it on, all of those mechanics are happening uh, naturally in the asset itself. That's awesome. So to take this to, uh, what examples can you share here? I mean, when you say NFTs, I know you mentioned essentially just uh, kind of any sort of uh, scarce content, if you will. What have you seen as some of the, the best examples? We'll start there. Yeah, so I really like what uh, Blau did for his recent drop everything. It was his first single of the year. And he basically released an NFT that was a physical version of it. So if you bought this digital piece of content, you got shipped a physical sound block representing that song. Uh, It's kind of a different way to contextualize different releases. So in the same way you see merch drops, you see vinyl releases, et cetera, et cetera. This is basically a new paradigm where you can do that in a digital format. And so for the context of this song, uh, there was an open edition, which meant for five minutes, anyone who came in and purchased them could get this. And there was an auction, which meant that the highest bidder got one. But outside of that, you know, that was the only time you could purchase these off the primary market. So now when you think about this song 100 years into the future, should that song become a really big hit? There's scarce digital content, which can prove, hey, I'm, a, I'm an owner of this collectible. And theoretically, if that song does well, the, the value of that collectible should appreciate in value as well. So if I, buy, if I buy the song and I get this physical representation of it and I sell, and I sell the NFT, then do I have to ship that physical representation of it to the, to the, to the buyer? 
You do not, no. That's kind of one of the more nuanced um, aspects of NFTs right now is that there's no way to link a physical and a digital version of it. But I would view right. the physical one as kind of like an added goodie on top of the NFT. You know, the NFT is the primary value capture mechanism and the physical item is just kind of like, you know, a way to spruce up what you what you bought in the first place. Okay, cool. That's awesome. So as, as you think, because I know there's other uh, artists where they, like, you think about stage visual designers that do incredible 3D animations and these long motion caps, like Gibson Hazard is one of my favorite examples as far as like a visual 3D artist. That stuff takes tons of time. Uh, I mean, I see that being a very intriguing, compelling digital asset. I'm very curious from your perspective, like you mentioned the black example and kind of tapping into music and some of the other ancillary assets uh, around his music. But when you think about the, the the growing space of NFTs as it pertains to music, what specific sorts of scarce assets do you really see being at the forefront of this this adoption? I think audio reactive NFTs. So basically NFTs that are programmed in such a way that the music is directly linked to the art that's playing underneath it. I think that that's amazing. You know, you mentioned a live show visual and I think this is a really good example of that. I think these NFTs where the artists are really leaning into the ownership of it. So they're baking in rights and um, secondary royalties into the NFT itself. So for example, if I were to release a song and say, the owner of this NFT is going to get 50% of all the royalties I generate from this song, you know, doing things like that, that give the NFT... Uh, inherent value is kind of like the next step of the puzzle that I think really intrigues me about how to take this to the next level. Yeah, for sure. No, that makes a lot of sense. One question too is with regards to like, and I know this is always in my experience tends to be like a good problem to have. It's like if you create an online course and it's at the point or an info product is at the point where people are like making a copy of it and letting other people torrent it, like chances are you've actually had enough adoption to warrant somebody doing that. Um, I mean, you think about music and how there was all this kind of like, I mean, back in the day when it was more like, uh, like physical CDs, like a leak could really destroy sales because people would be able to get it before it hit the market today. If music leaks, maybe it ends up creating more hype because the average consumer is still going to actually get it by way of a traditional DSP like Spotify or something. How do you, th- I mean, is there any protections in place? Cause to the extent that you're getting a digital, a, a, a unique music layered with visuals, like screen record and put it on YouTube or uh, like, sh- yeah. I mean, how do you, is there a way to protect against that? Or is that just kind of like uh, a good problem to have, if you will? I think it's a good problem to have. I think like leaning into the fact that all content is very easily reproducible in a digital world, you know, it's actually just sort of adding to the uh, awareness and exposure of that asset. You know, the cool thing about NFTs is that regardless of who copies it, you can prove who the owner is based on the, the notions of that token. And so like if someone goes and screenshots my NFT, if they go post on YouTube, et cetera, et cetera, that's kind of all to the benefit of the owner. And I think that the more popular and viral an image goes, ultimately the more value is going to go accrue back to that original source. Yeah. No, I love that. That's interesting. When you think about, I, I'm going back to, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen 2 Chain's show. I think it's on like GQ, but most expensivest shit. I'm curious yeah. what's like the most <laughs> expensivest shit version of an NFT. Like <laughs> what are like the, the, the most ball in like NFTs that have sold for the most? I think there was an article you shared beforehand where it was uh, from like cryptoart.io that showed that there's been over $50 million in crypto art sales. Like, what I mean, what are some of these massive transactions that are happening and, and what are the products or offerings, if you will? There's this project called CryptoPunks, which is these digital alien characters. There's only like 16,000 of them in the world. And uh, very recently, one sold for like $1.5 million. And it's, you know, a, a JPEG image. But because of the fact that it's a part of this like really elusive set that has these different characteristics, there's this really vibrant community around it. And so people have been taking their CryptoPunks and making them their avatars on Twitter. And it's kind of funny that people are using it as like a status symbol game to say like, hey, I own this really exclusive punk and you know that I spent a ton of money on it. So I get to rock it as my avatar. I mean, it's, it's, I've never, I've never been super intrigued by like a ton of jewelry and like Rolexes and stuff. And I feel like it's the same thing. <laughs> like when someone walks mm-hmm. around with a $30,000 Rolex, like I can't tell the difference between a $30,000 Rolex and a $10,000 Rolex, but I'm sure they just love it showing people that they have that Rolex on. It's like, okay, cool. I got this crypto punk. I'm, I'm a baller. You know what I mean? But it's interesting because exactly. you look at like art though. And even outside of just the, whatever, like egotistical side may be involved there that you kind of alluded to. It's like, 
Like there's an investment, like there's an investment strategy behind a lot of our collectors because a lot of yeah. the stuff appreciates over time. It's not just like I'm balling, check out this like dope ass painting I have, but there's like See, but that painting is in their house though. It's not they don't put they don't make it their Twitter photo. You know, yeah, what I, I mean, mean there's like examples <laughs> on all, all sides. Yeah. I mean, I feel yeah, you, yeah. but you gotta feel me too, bro. You gotta meet I, the I got here. you. I got no, I'm saying you ain't you foolish. <laughs> I'm kidding. You gonna fight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on my way right now, bro. Yeah. I just dropped a pin. Yeah. Um I have a question. It's the same question that David Lee asked from our Patreon group. Shout out to our patrons. Uh, if I'm an indie artist, how do I start getting involved in this world? What's like the first place to go? How do you, how do I decide to 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 you know have this and uh, you know have this form of of currency and then use it or or this digital uh, art piece and use it to my ability as like an indie artist? Like what what do I what do I even start with? You know. Yeah, so I think there's this notion that NFTs are really scary. In principle, it's basically just uploading a file to the blockchain. It's no different than uploading like a YouTube video or a post on Instagram or anything like that. It's just using a different mechanism to do that. And so I mentioned earlier a protocol called Zora. One of the best pieces of that is that it's permissionless in the sense that anyone who has an invite can go ahead and uh, upload to that platform. So there's a couple of these different marketplaces that are completely permissionless, which means you don't need an invite. Um, you can go and do it at your own free whim. So Mark Cuban uploaded his first NFT to a platform called Rarible. And that's one where you can just go in and do it yourself. You don't need anyone to give you permission. You can do upload whatever you want. And what I'd say to indie artists is, you know, create an NFT or basically a file around a piece of content that you're really excited about. So whether it's your next album, it's your next single, et cetera, et cetera, and build in NFTs into that marketing strategy. So it's less about using it as a sale mechanism. It's more about showing that you're ahead of the, the curve in terms of technology. And sort of use one of these platforms to be like, hey, I'm poking around with NFTs. You know, more times than not, you'll find that uh, NFT collectors are really just willing to lean into like new usage of the technology. And so a lot of these smaller artists that don't have huge Spotify followings are signing up for these platforms, you know, doing really creative drops and seeing sales in like the thousands of dollars for, for a piece of content that, you know, is basically equivalent to like a million streams, but happens over such a short period of time that it's uh, a really fun frontier to play around in. Wait, so can we kind of double down there? So let's say someone releases a song or, or a piece of art uh, or artwork with, with an NFT and it starts selling for thousands of dollars. What is, the, what is the incentive for the people that don't necessarily know the artist or the music or even like the piece of art that much at that point? Like, like how, is it, how is it kind of shooting off like it is in these, in these smaller communities like that? I think it's patronage. You know, I think that for a lot of these NFT collectors, they like to see people embracing new technology and they're willing to support creatives that are pursuing their career, in, you know, a new and exciting. Way. And so like, I think that there is obviously an, an expectation that this artist will do better in the future. And so by collecting them early as they sort of grow their career, that piece will be worth more. But for some of these smaller acts, you know, there's a community of, of musician NFT collectors that are bidding on each other's works that are showing support and signal. And I think that, um, you know, the expectation or incentive is more just about the space as a whole growing, right? And mm -hmm. sort of proving that people are willing to commit to the value of this digital content. And in turn, over the long term, I think we'll see better use cases emerge where that value is very clear. And so they can kind of be rewarded for being a really early adopter of that. Right. So it's not just an investment in the artist, it's an investment in the space in general. Absolutely. When you think through the timeline of adoption, like what do you feel are like, um, because I think this even came out of our conversation prior. I think like right now it's like, this is still very much in an early adopter phase where it's like, unless you as an artist are very authentically like interested in the space of NFTs or um, you have a good audience kind of like crossover where your audience might be interested, like, this might just feel like you're there's a good chance that this is just going to blow past a lot of your fans that might not either get it or might not want it. Um, not to say that's not going to come in due time, but as you think about us getting to that point in time, what do you feel are going to be some of the major inflection points? What do you think needs to happen and how long give or take do you see this really uh, taking? Yeah, I'd say about like a year or two until we're seeing like consumer grade NFTs right now, it's very hobbyist in nature. You know, a lot of these NFTs are really high tier. We need to have a high, um, amount to spend to be able to participate. I mentioned earlier, like $500 to $1,000 is the base price for a lot of these kind of custom NFTs. I think that's going to be the case for a while longer. Um, you know, to the point about what we need to get there, I think that platforms like Nifty Gateway that allow users to buy with a credit card is a really great example of that. You know, one of the biggest blockers to NFT today is that most platforms need to have MetaMask and Ether to be able to transact. 
And while that's something that I do every day, I recognize it's by no means standard at this point. And so like artists being cognizant that when they're doing these NFT drops, they're marketing to an entirely new audience of crypto native users and leaning into marketing around those users and trying to get in those collector circles is actually far more powerful than expecting your um, fans on Instagram to come and collect your NFTs. Because realistically, that's just not going to happen for at least another year or two until the platforms are built out that support those interactions. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and alleviates friction from these kind of uh, people that are trying to tip their toes in the water. When you think about the different like marketplaces, you mentioned Nifty Gateway, Super Rare. Can you talk a little bit further about like what kind of the, the landscape looks like as it stands with regards to marketplaces, maybe pros and cons of each and who you think will uh, continue to really grow and become the kind of the, the leader? Yeah, for sure. So Nifty Gateway is leading with the most sales volume right now. Like I said, it's because they have credit card purchases. They're doing these Supreme Child drops that are really attractive to collectors. Uh, Super Air is a one of one marketplace, which means that every piece on Super Air is released as a one of one edition. And that's contrary to something like Nifty Gateway, where you have multiple editions of a piece, you have packs, you have silent auctions, you kind of have all these different mechanics. Um, Super Air really leans on curation. So it's very difficult to get on that platform. But once you do, it's kind of like a status symbol that you're like, hey, I'm a badass NFT artist. I got accepted into Super Air. Uh, there's a new platform called Foundation that just launched that's very similar to Super Air in the fact that it's highly curated. They're really leaning on user experience and sort of um, optimizing for that like aha moment or that confetti moment when you collect. And so if you go to Foundation, you'll notice there's a very specific style around 3D art, generative art, render art, et cetera, et cetera. And then, uh, like I mentioned, Zora, so an open protocol to create NFTs and sort of redefining the way that that asset is created and issued on the blockchain. There's honestly over like 50 issuers at this point to make NFTs, and it's really just a matter of preference around style, curation, um, what type of currency you want to pay in, and kind of figuring out like which which artists you really align and where they're releasing their work on. So, um, sorry, Sam, I had one question specifically about that. Um, so specifically, I mean, we've seen different distributors, for example, because this is kind of how I'm thinking of it in my head with these platforms. Um, we've seen different distributors charge different prices. And you said a little bit earlier, like, you know, DistroKid will charge just to put it up. And then you got STEM that charges 5% of whatever is streamed. And you said a little bit earlier, most places just take uh, a cut of the first sale and then not again. Does that defer between these platforms at all? Or is that is that part of the part of the pitch on some of these platforms that they actually charge differently? Has that start, has that begun to differentiate yet? Or is there is that kind of like the baseline standard across all of these platforms? Yeah, it's a really great question. I think the baseline standard is taking some level of fee on the primary sale. That amount definitely varies by the marketplace. Uh, some other marketplaces are starting to do like add-on fees. So for example, if I want to spend $100 on an NFT, they'll charge $30 on top of that, or $3, excuse me, for 3%. And so even if it's a secondary sale, every time there's a transaction, these platforms are capturing some value. But I'd say to your earlier question, yeah, um, it's kind of interesting because most artists aren't really talking about like the primary fee. It's more about sort of the collector base associated with the platform. And so to them, being able to get whitelisted and sort of release on these curated platforms is more important than the fee that's getting taken. You know, I do expect over the long term, though, that I hope that fee goes close to zero. I think in the long term, all of these platforms will not be able to take fees for a service as simple as sort of like listing and, and surfacing an NFT. But for the short term, kind of given how new and exciting it is, I think it makes perfect sense that these platforms are um, charging a listing fee to be able to surface the best work possible. So you think that instead of them potentially raising their prices over time, because there'll be more transactions, people will actually lower their prices? Yeah, on the marketplace fee specifically. I think there's going to be other ways to capture value that's not extractive. And this is kind of what crypto is in general, right? Is removing intermediaries, removing transaction fees. You know, right. Over the long term, all of these systems are not going to charge transaction fees to perform a service. That value is going to be captured uh, in the form of a token or in the form of some sort of ownership or equity that accrues value as these platforms get more valuable. Right. Love that. When it comes to a couple of quick, quick, more quick questions with regards to NFTs before we shift to some other stuff. Um, when you think about crypto currencies and the different tokens, I know there's lots of like speculation, um, but I mean, it is interesting because you have a website like Coin Market Cap, which does a really good job at aggregating all sorts of data as it pertains to the value of these different tokens. Is there uh, any sort of kind of like third party NFT value? Or I mean, is it really just kind of live across all these marketplaces as if uh, looking at the, the price of a show on StubHub? 
Yeah, so cryptoart.io is the one that I've been using the most for NFTs. You know, quite frankly, NFT uh, market pricing is very new. There's a mm-hmm. platform called Showtime that I really like that helps to display different NFTs. But like when it comes to finding a market value for them in the same way of coin market cap, we're still really early on. And so what that looks like today is on these individual marketplaces. So on Nifty Gateway, on Superware, on Foundation, it'll show the the bid history and the sales history directly on that platform rather than it being on like an aggregator left by market cap. Yeah, no, awesome. Um, and then, I mean, when it comes to uh, like, if, if I was an artist and um, like, are there further resources? Cause I really just want to make this as actionable as possible for people to be able to get started and create their own NFTs. Um, like, I, I do think this is a really interesting space for people to play. I know you alluded a bit to some of this earlier, but like create a product, go to one of these marketplaces, try and list it, promote it across your socials or hope that you get some exposure from the actual marketplace and snowball. <laughs> yeah. There's kind of a two-pronged strategy here, right? I think that one path is just yourself and drop it without any form of um, acceptance from the NFT community. So like I mentioned, Rarible is a great platform to do this. You don't need to be approved to do it. You can create an NFT today. No questions asked. The other pathway is to present a package and go to someone like Nifty Gateway, like Super, like Foundation. Be like, hey, I have a strategy around this. I'm going to do an NFT rollout for my whole album and I want to do it on your platform. Um, with that case in mind, a lot of the times these platforms will work with you to promote that. And you can kind of guarantee you'll have a higher value release because you have the support and the curation behind these platforms. And they'll want to work with you because they know this isn't like an offshoot, one-off thing. This is something that you put a lot of time into and really want to lean into it as part of your brand. So they don't necessarily listen to see if your music is good. It's how serious you are about the technology itself. I think it's a combination of all the above. It's just more mm-hmm. showing that this is a, a very well thought out process, right? And that you're kind of going above and beyond the um, expectation of just creating a piece of content for past work or doing something in an hour or something like that. Like just creating a story around it, you know, the same way you would pitch an album to a label or at least to a label. It's the exact same thing, just with a kind of a different medium in mind. And then the other uh, platform you were talking about is more like releasing it independent. Yeah, rare bowls. Yep, exactly like that. Doing an independent release. You don't have to get approval from anyone. You can do it today. I love that. And I think that just ladders back to the same kind of underlying ethos of crypto, of kind of decentralization. Um, can you speak a little more to uh, now? I kind of want to shift gears towards um, like Audius. And I mean, before mm-hmm. we even dive in, because I mean, I think a lot of it also ties back to that same ethos, decentralization. Can you, di- can you just kind of set the stage? What is Audius for starters? Yeah, Audius is a decentralized streaming protocol. The way I like to help people understand it, it's a SoundCloud, but built on the blockchain. And so what this means is every aspect of Audius is completely owned by its users. So rather than the SoundCloud era where all of these artists made their careers off the back of remixes and SoundCloud went and raised a um, $100 million round and captured all that value, Audius is that exact same primitive, but all of that value is going directly to its users rather than Audius as the parent company. And so with that premise in mind, I think that you can see some really interesting incentives for artists to contribute to this platform and sort of build up the community around them such that as this platform gets more valuable, they can also capture that value along the way. That's awesome. So to peel that apart, um, when you say the, the the value goes back to the actual artists and potentially even the fans on the platform, I mean, is that by, what's the mechanic there? Like just by an artist building up a listenership, they're now essentially getting, they're generating tokens, like some of the actual audio tokens. Is that the, the mechanism of kind of compensation, if you will, and ownership? Yeah, so the value capture... Yeah, it all goes back through the audio platform token. So the way I like to liken this, it's like equity, but it's a cryptocurrency. And so, you know, when you think about the way that that token becomes valuable, um, developing a community around it and basically adding in mechanisms for people to unlock better platform access. So for example, today on SoundCloud, I pay $15 a month to host my content. We can envision a world where in order to access pro features on Audius, you need to hold this token. You know, the more people that own this token for these different services, the more scarce it becomes. And theoretically, the more valuable the token becomes. I think that's kind of like an underlying premise of all cryptocurrency. But I think what's exciting about Audius is that there are mechanisms here to play with the music industry in ways that we've never seen before. So for example, on Spotify today, every uh, song you stream has a fixed rate associated with that. The artist has no ability to choose what that rate is or where that money goes. But with Audius, you can design peer-to-peer systems, which means if I stream your song today, you're going to get all of that money in real time. And you can determine exactly how much you want to be paid for every song that I stream. And so using this kind of crypto primitives, we can build tools and payment rails to allow artists to be a lot more free 
and flexible around the ways that they get paid and interact with their communities and their fans. Right. So how does Audius get paid? Audius um, doesn't have monetization associated with it today. So this is something we're working on in the future. Audius owns a percentage of the audio token supply, which is kind of our Mm. underlying bet on the platform itself. And over time, we want to create different ways for uh, Audius to capture value along the way. So similar to how we were talking about Super having a platform fee associated with it today, you know, when we roll out monetization uh, in the future, I envision that for at least the the immediate short term, there's going to be these kind of payments associated with it such that, you know, if there's a stream for $1, Audius may capture 10% of that value back to a global fee pool that's shared amongst all audio token holders. Oh, shit. Okay, dope. Um, so what your role, your title, head of crypto strategy, what do you do on a day-to-day basis? What, what does that look like? How do you work with artists? How do you interact with artists? Like what that that's, that's you're the first person I ever met with that title. (laughs) So, uh, how do you, you know, you know, what do you, what do you, what do you do at the, at the company? What's your day-to-day look like? Yeah. So there's two different aspects to this. One is helping under artists understand what the hell cryptocurrency is. You know, mm-hmm. 95% of artists on Audius have no clue what crypto is. They've never touched it before. And so I'm sort of a sounding board to help them better understand what's going on under the hood. More specifically on the crypto side of things, I've been working really deeply in the Ethereum ecosystem for about four years now. Mm-hmm. There's a very specific narrative and type of project that gets accepted by that community. And so a big part of my job is making sure that people in the Ethereum community So these really deep um, crypto native people, they know what Audius is. They know that we know what we're doing and we're building the project in such a way that embodies the ethos of the crypto ecosystem and sort of playing that bridge between new users who have never touched Audius before and then deeply experienced users in the crypto side of the world and sort of sitting right in the middle there to show them that this project has value. Right. Cool. So I guess how does how do you see how do you see that role growing and shifting as people as that ninety five percent gets smaller and smaller and people actually start to know how to use the 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 platform? Yeah, it's building use cases such that these artists and these users can capture the upside of the value they create. You know, it goes back to what I said before. Um, one of the cool things with the audio token is we're adding in ways to uh, enhance your experience on Audius using the token. So different features of the platform. Form, the ability to upload content, the ability to DM artists, um, a lot of these Discord type features. You know, there's a world in which the best features on Audius require tokens to be held. And so for me, it's about basically introducing what those things are so that artists can understand them and not feel very scared when they come to the platform. You know, we never want to make it such that you need to have tokens to use the platform, but we want to design systems so that the more you lean into the crypto native aspects of Audius, the better experience you get and the more value you can capture over time. Cool. And that same that same dynamic applies then to I presume the actual like consumers listening to the music as far as unlocking features. What does that look like over time as the token itself becomes more valuable? So right now, say uh, just for easy numbers' sake, a token is one dollar, and I want to just I know you guys are not copying Spotify, but you want to get rid of ads, so I want to pay a dollar a month to get rid of ads. Um, so and that's one token, but say uh, a year from now, one token is not worth $10. Like, is that still going to be like essentially cost me as an end user one USD <laughs> in order to enable that right. feature? Or do you see is there kind of a little bit of like ads. agility and, and fluctuation <laughs> with regards to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, does that change as well? Yeah. So this is the coolest part about crypto is that you never have to send the token to get these features. You just hold it in your wallet. When you don't want to have those benefits anymore, you can go ahead and sell the token on a secondary market. So there's no longer a sunk cost associated with using these platforms. You basically hold the tokens for the duration you want to use the benefits of the platform. When it's time for you to leave, you have the full freedom to go ahead and liquidate that for USD, Ether, whatever tokens you want to hold instead. That's awesome. And then there is, I mean, a, a somewhat of a monetization aspect where people are actually buying tokens from you in USD, right? They can buy tokens in USDC, but I think it's important to recognize that um, when, I'm, when I'm talking about streaming an artist's song on the platform, that's going to be in a US dollar currency. It's so like, I'm going to pay them a dollar for a track. That's not the audio token. Mm-hmm. Again, like I said before, audio tokens are kind of more like ownership or equity in the platform versus being used as a transactional form of payment to you know, pay artists or unlock services on the platform. For sure. And then one other thing you mentioned too, is kind of this notion of being able to like, like, I I mean, it, it's funny because I have friends that are deep into the world of finance and have friends that are deep into the world of crypto. Um, 
that know way more about it and way more about what's moving the markets than I do. But it's funny because I'm like, bro, like you can tell me what stock or what what random altcoin is about to like pop off within the next year or two. I can tell you like hottest rapper coming up out of Atlanta. Uh, to me, it's really <laughs> interesting to think about what it looks like if you're actually able to have equity in some sort of like uh, financial marketplace of sorts in artists. So can you speak a little more to kind of what it looks like when you have equity in artists and how that ties into the long-term strategy? Yeah, for sure. So I've been doing a lot of work around social tokens. This is basically a brand or community that issues a currency to represent themselves. So I'm working with an artist named RAC right now. He has his own token called RAC token. And what this does is allow the community to have a shared value around that Discord server, around the Twitch community, the Patreon community, all of these different platforms that artists are capturing value. You can now have one token that basically is the glue that holds it all together. And so to your point about investing in artists, um, there are going to be mechanisms in place where I could buy, um, you know, Yeezy coin, I could buy Kygo coin, whatever it might be, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's important to recognize that the value of these tokens comes from the strength of a community. So whereas a lot of artists may have these really big followings, we're going to see that these diehard communities like Kenny Beats, for example, a Kenny coin would do incredible because he's got a really diehard community. And as a fan of that community, I can basically buy a liquid instrument that allows me to capture the upside of that community's growth. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, no, and I mean, Kenny is actually, I mean, he seems to be a, a very active user of Audius as well, yeah? Yeah, he's an advisor to our project. He's been doing some really amazing stuff. I mean, it's just like, what we want to have on the platform. Like, he is a shining example of someone that's doing everything right in terms of building a brand, a community, and like a really low following around his project. Yeah, for sure. So when you mentioned the model and like the the rack and uh, like you, is that essentially needs to be its own kind of like artists creating their own distinct coins is kind of what, where that model lies now, if people really want to be able to invest in their own artists. Yeah, that's correct. So there's platforms like rally and rollout here that allow artists to create and issue their own currencies. So Portugal, the man issued their own token a few weeks ago through rally. Um, REC did his through that platform Zora that I talked about earlier. And at the end of the day, you know, creating a token is not really that difficult. That's more getting the manpower behind it to market it properly and make a statement with it. And that's where a lot of these issuers are coming into play is they're helping these artists understand what's going on. They're giving them the tools to create their token. They're setting them up with the foundation around uh, token permission access and sort of these features that this token can have value over the short term. Yeah, for sure. So if I buy a token, a Kenny Beats token, right when it's right when he makes them or an RIC token, right when he makes them. And then five years later, that token is worth a lot more. Is it similar to a stock where I sell the token for USD on a secondary market? And because I've invested in this artist from the beginning, I can now kind of cash out on that, on that early investment. Yep. That's exactly right. Damn. Cool, man. I mean, shit, I get it. I get you, Cooper. I know why you're into this. I'm into this. I'm about to go read a book. <laughs> I'm like, damn, where do I go get more information on this? Damn, that's sick. Uh, I guess that's like my next question. What What are some resources? I know Sam kind of asked that a little bit earlier, but you know, where can people go to learn more about this technology to become experts, to become their own Coopers, you know? <laughs> yeah. There's some really great platforms out there that are doing really fantastic news coverage. So I write frequently for this blog called The Defiant. It's covering all things crypto, um, social tokens, NFTs, DeFi. There's a social token incubator called Seed Club. So for anyone that's considering wanting to do their own token, um, this project basically takes in creators, helps them flesh out their ideas around their token and basically gut checks them on whether or not it's actually viable or not. Um, I'd like to say I'm super active about this stuff on Twitter and share a lot of good resources from people in the community. So you know, my, my first suggestion would be just get back on Twitter, man. Like everything in crypto is happening on Twitter right now. And then to the extent to which you're interested, you know, Clubhouse is becoming a really able source of information for a lot of this crypto content. It was fun. We'll have to tune in. Um, cool, man. No, I mean, I, I think, uh, I guess one other question. So Warner Music was a, uh, I, I mean, I, I know you're more familiar with Dapper Labs than I am, I presume. Um, I mean, Warner Music it was a big investor in Dapper Labs. For I'm curious, A, if you could just kind of like set the stage, like what is Dapper Labs? And then B, like why you feel Warner saw this as a very strategic investment and partnership. Yeah, Dapper Labs has been building consumer grade crypto products for a couple of years now. So they made this application called Crypto Kitties in 2017, which was basically the first mainstream viral NFT use case. More recently, Dapper Labs has built a Flow blockchain. Flow blockchain is a custom-built blockchain specifically for NFT and gaming use cases. So you may have heard of NBA Top Shots before. 
what this is is a way to collect digital um, MBA moments, you know, in, in a crypto native way. To your point about why Warner saw value in Dapper, it's very obvious that Dapper is building for like a mainstream audience. I think there's very few projects in crypto that are doing this in a meaningful way. And so for them, it was very calculated bet just saying that Dapper has done this before. They had a lot of success with CryptoKitties. They're now having a lot of success with Top Shot. I think that this project is going to continue to deliver, you know, high caliber games and experiences around blockchain that people can wrap their head around. Right. Um, I kind of have a follow-up question to that. So this, obviously, we've talked about how the artist uh, kind of catches out on this experience and how artists c- can be a lot more equitable and, um, you know, I guess, uh, you know, more wealthy from this experience because they kind of have control over their, over their, their art or their tokens. Um, my question to you is, is this a sort of ecosystem that everyone can benefit from? So like, can major labels benefit from this? Can indie labels benefit from this? Can publicists benefit from this? Can it, can it trickle to, to everyone across the industry? Or is it mostly if you are an independent artist, this is the way to go? I think that all of these parties are going to see a lot of upside from being um, an expert in how to use this technology. I think that a lot of creators are going to be really you know, unclear about how to use it in an effective way. So to have, have like a challenge you to handle the logistics of making your NFTs, of marketing your NFTs, having relationships with these platforms. You know, the same way we see uh, labels having really good connections with DSPs today. I see a world where a lot of these labels have really good connection with NFT platforms, you know, the best social token issuers, the best um, crypto native music platforms, and sort of just like opening these doors so that when it comes to being able to release on curated platforms, you have a much higher chance of getting on them if you work with one of these labels that has a good relationship with them. Right. Damn. Awesome, man. Um, well, this has been super illuminating, eye-opening, one of the most interesting things I've ever talked about. So, so very, very glad that uh, we could get you on the podcast. I think people will be super excited to hear this one. Um, you know, I before the episode, I was like, Sam, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to cut down some of these questions because <laughs> because we we just had a lot of questions uh, about the ecosystem in general, NFTs, and I think that people this will be a good primer for people to listen to. So we really appreciate it for sure. And I really appreciate you guys having me on. What I'll say is that I think there are legitimately under fifty artists in the world using crypto in a, in a meaningful way today. So for anyone listening to this podcast, you are extremely early to the puzzle. Don't feel like you need to wait for signs of validation to get started. And the ones who lean into this and take this seriously now are going to see tremendous upside over the next couple of years when this goes parabolic. Awesome. It's a major I, key I, right there. I got one question. How do I lean into this? When we get off, when we get, when we get off this <laughs> podcast, how do I lean into it? Do I, do I sign up for audience? Jordan, Jordan this, is for, this, is for, this is meant to be for our <laughs> listeners, not for you, bro. Hey, bro. You can hey. say that for after the show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying, bro. But, you know, if people who aren't creators, I'm sure there are a lot of people that aren't creators that listen oh, to this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Managers that listen to this. I'm sure there are a lot of publicists that listen to this. Where do we go? You know, where do the music business people yeah. go? Yeah, so I've been designing a lot of ecosystems around curation, you know, in the same way that finding new music is a talent. I think when it comes to these crypto native ecosystems, being able to surface and basically curate around valuable content is going to have so much financial upside. So like on Audius, for example, making playlists on Super Air, helping to surface the best NFTs, you know, just becoming an expert in these different pockets of crypto and sort of being, you know, a go to resource when it comes to helping people learn. Um, I've been spending a lot of my time doing proposed farming, which is a really foreign concept. But what it means is you go to a project, you propose a way to make it better, and you get paid when they implement it into the platform. And so these kind of avenues are open every day. It's only going to get bigger and bigger. And so, you know, just leaning into these platforms I mentioned today, you know, signing up, poking around on it, and then trying to figure out who the best players are. I think that the doors sort of open themselves over time. Awesome. Cool, man. Well, Cooper, really appreciate the wisdom, man. I think this has uh, been super valuable for the audience. Uh, I definitely think the, um, I mean, both from a practical perspective, as well as a lot of the evolutions that are taking place in the market, man. So keep up the great work and uh, I'm sure we'll be seeing you again. Thank you guys. It was a pleasure. Keep up the great work as well. Damn, well, that episode was incredible. I'm definitely inspired. Um, I think the way he kind of closed it at the end is that like we're still very early uh i think about how we're seeing all this movement in alternative asset markets with regards to pokemon cards uh sports trading cards i think like it's inevitable that that's going to ladder over into digital collectibles by way of nfts so i think to the extent that you can still be very early player in this market to me is is fascinating to really think about um what do you think 
Yeah, I think one thing that he said near the end there is that there's only 50 artists or so that are actively using this technology. Um, so people can kind of really get in on the ground level. Um, I also think throughout the throughout the episode, he made a lot of connections to things that people know, right? When we talked about what it was like releasing music through a major label versus an indie and what the equivalent of that would look like for NFTs. I think that'll give people a lot of eye-opening um, realizations on how this really works uh, in the world with, with music in it. So um, I'm super excited, not just for people to um you know take things away from this episode but to actually go into the world and 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 benefit from it yeah for sure and i know he mentioned his twitter as a resource do want to encourage you guys to check it out his handle on twitter is koopa troopa uh (laughs) c-o-o-o-p-a-h-t-r-o-o-p-a i'll say one more time c-o-o-o-p-a-h-t-r-o-o-p-a so definitely holla at him on twitter (laughs) wait i'm sorry I'm sorry, say I say it one more time. Koopa Troopa. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to hear you say C O O O O O O B A A O O. That's amazing. Well, uh, I think we've clearly had enough time together for today, so we're going to have to close out this episode, but we appreciate y'all greatly, and we'll be back next week. <laughs>